Proverbs 11, 1 through 3. The Lord detests dishonest scales, but accurate weights find favor with him. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. Sometimes, as Christians, it's easy to get upset with God because He just won't let us do whatever we want to do. Now, one could say that if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and your strength, then there are only certain things you want to do. So, well, one of these examples is found here in book of Proverbs. So this, this month we've been actually talking about what it means to have wisdom and not just wisdom like, oh, I, I could give you some good advice on some things like, hey, you know, sell that stock or, you know, whatever the case may be. I, that, that is a different kind of wisdom that is being actually talked about in Scripture. The last couple of weeks we have been talking about the book of Ecclesiastes and some things that that shows us. And the book of Ecclesiastes was written probably by Solomon from the perspective of a philosopher. It was just a fictional philosopher or teacher or whatever the case may be. But he wanted a creative way to be able to convey that kind of wisdom. Now we see in Proverbs where Proverbs is more of a compilation of just well-known wisdom that's all godly. That makes sense. It's like a library of wisdom. So if you want to know how to do something with your money or how to treat one another or how to live in a civil environment with those maybe who don't believe like you do or don't dress like you do or don't look like you do, Proverbs is a great way to do this. It's a great, great thing to get into. So Proverbs is this compilation, and if we remember the last couple weeks we've been talking about how God set up his community, those who were chosen by him, and he wanted to give them certain uh, nuggets of wisdom, and he wanted to give them certain laws that was basically saying, if you want to live a life that is smooth and blessed by me, here's what it looks like. This is how we live in this covenant family, is if we are to live a life that is blessed by God, we have certain things that, that we do in the way that we love. But it was more than that. Because what we find out in the Old Testament, that God had a certain plan for His people. It wasn't a plan that included just lavishing them with wealth and just so they'll just relax and have, not have to do anything. It was, a, it was a plan that involved them being set apart and separate from the rest of the world. So these Israelite people, those who were called by God's name, they had a certain mission and they had a certain focus that the rest of the world did not. And that was okay. But like we often do if we're in this story, that we will absolutely follow what God wants because we want to be distinct from everyone else, right? But it's nice that God sets us apart and, and, and shows us what He wants from us. But there is something that's a part of our nature, and just because something is natural doesn't mean it's right. Right? Exactly. Amen? Okay, yes. so okay. it's part of our nature, something that's a part of our nature. It's within us that wants to follow God, but at the same time wants to have another foot in the world. We see the great fun that the world is having. We see what, what kind of things are happening because of this. And what we realize is when we, for those of us who have spent some time in the world, what we consider the world, quote unquote, is that people make it look great. People make it look like a wonderful blast. But there is something about a life that is separate from God that leads to destruction and misery. So 
what we see is temporary bliss and happiness, but the joy is not sustainable. So I wanted to lay this foundation because I think it's very important to understand where they're coming from with this wisdom. Does anyone in here have King James Version by any chance? I won't judge you. But uh, if you have, no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. It's very interesting. If we could put up the, the passage again. Um, the passage says, and, and this is the NIV version, the Lord detests dishonest scales with accurate weights um, find favor with him. If you have the King James Version, it says, um, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. You know, we're getting into something that is very interesting and very cultural back in these days. It was very almost taken for granted that if you were, a, let's say, a taxpayer, if you were a person who worked in the marketplace that sold things by the pound, or what we would say by the pound, that, you know, it was pretty common to kind of make the scales a little bit of off balance in your favor. And it was something that, by the way, was known. It wasn't, it wasn't anything that was like, well, hey, what did, you, what did you do here? Why, why did you do this? Because everyone did it. Let's just be honest. So if you were going to someone, you're buying a horse, for instance, or maybe you were buying an ox, then, then perhaps you might have a certain scale that wasn't exactly even. So that's how they would actually buy. Yeah, like as long as it weighed the same as the other side, then that was that was equal. I would I would give you it's like it's like if you go to a store or a restaurant, you see on their sub sandwich uh, five dollars and ninety nine cents. That is the same that is the same idea as what would happen here. That they would have the weight, and as long as on this side, on the other side, you balanced it out, that was enough money. So we, we understand how the weights and measures go. But what people would do is fix the scale so that I would say a little bit more, oh, I'm sorry, you need to give me a little bit more than that. And it was common practice. So if something in those days were common practice, and, it, and any time you went and bought something, they kind of tried to get a little bit more off the top, if someone were not to do that, <laughs> that person would stand out like a sore thumb. I mean, you're not behaving the way that the rest of the world is. Do you think you're better than everyone? And it's not so much for the people of God if living according to the way this was and the way this is. It's not so much that they felt like they were better than everyone. It's that they served a different king. Their citizenship was elsewhere. Yes, Caesar can say what Caesar is saying. Yes, um, Nebuchadnezzar can say what Nebuchadnezzar is saying. Yes, the, whatever king is in power at the time that is an outside king, whoever has conquered us, whoever has taken over, and whoever makes rules, they can do whatever they want to do. But we serve a God who holds a different standard in life. So these folks, what God was trying to do here, I kind of see it maybe on the surface level, was to take us back to the Exodus. When the Israelite people were taken from, and they were delivered from Exodus, I mean from Egypt. And the first, one of the first things that Moses told the folks to do was to build a tabernacle, was to do different things, things to themselves and others and, and form into groups and they and they were called to have an identity that was separate from the identity by which they just came. We see even earlier than that though. We see what Abraham and his family God called them to a different standard of living not because oh you need to rub it in people's faces look how great I am but we're so humbled that we serve a God who has a different standard. This word here uh, detests, and in the King James is an abomination, 
is this word tom evav or to evav in the in the Hebrew. And what that literally means, it's not like, ooh, I'm not going to touch that because it's yucky. You know, that's what we think of when we think of abomination or detestable. It actually means something completely different, but along those lines. And let me try to give you a mental picture of what that is. Let's say you're going on the perfect vacation. You've got to fly down to Florida or fly over to whatever you are doing, you know. And you're ready. You, you've been waiting for this for a couple years now. You have your whole plan set. You're going to get there. You're going to unload your stuff. And you're just going to sit on the beach and do absolutely nothing until you cook like a lobster on the beach, right? That, that's your plan. But one of the things, so you, you got it all planned out. So you, got, you even asked for a window seat because you love to see outside. Anyone else love the window seat on a plane? love the window seat. That's the most wonderful thing. I, I'm like a little kid, like, oh, I'm going to the clouds, we can walk on, you know all the things that you find as a kid. You still think that as a doll, don't, don't act like you don't. So you get to the airport, you're excited because you have all your bags and you have everything that you need and you even, you even for, you know, that one thing that you always forget when you take on vacation, you even brought that. And you always get the halfway there and you're thinking, oh man, I forgot that one thing, but you brought it. Everything is perfect. And then they put you next to a toddler for the 13 hour flight. You ever? 13 hour. You're going far away. 13 hours. In fact, you're not even going that far away. You're just going in circles. Long flight is what I'm trying to say here. Tokyo. We're going to Tokyo. So you're you're ready for this vacation. You're so excited. And there was one thing you didn't account for, and that was the toddler next to you that loved to pull hair. I'm I'm covered. And then you and then scream the entire time. So this idea of this perfect time, you know it's not the kid's fault. There's nothing wrong with this child. But you have this idea in your mind of what everything's going to look like. Or maybe you're at your favorite restaurant and you've been waiting, you've been dieting for a long time, but this is your cheat day, right? And you and you get your food after this wait, this, this buildup, and oh, it's taking a little bit longer. That's okay, I'm ready. And there's something catastrophically wrong with your meal. I don't know, whatever it is. This idea that this perfect situation is tainted by an undesirable outcome, that is that word. That God had set forward this plan for His people to look and act and feel like Him. And anything that does not follow that standard and live within that box this, this freedom mentality is going to just put a weight around our ankles and the joy is leaving. That's that word. Tokiva. So, the, the Hebrews were, were great at saying one word and trying to have this word picture. So, let's get more into this passage because it tells us more than just a surface level of what we read. And this particular newer version of NIV says, The Lord abhors dishonest scales, but accurate weights are His delight. Okay, we, we figured that out. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. This idea of pride, and what we're looking at here is this word, and we all know what pride means, it's the, the puffing up of the chest, it's... It's, I'm better than this, arrogance. You know, we think of all that. That's absolutely true. That's what we're looking at here. But it's also this idea that I deserve way much more than I've been given. That even, even looking at God from this perspective, I deserve way much more than what He's given me. And can I just say this as a side note? And don't take this as a downer situation, what I'm about to say. But whatever situation we're in, 
God owes us nothing. God owes you nothing. I hope we're all on the same page about that. But, through His infinite mercy and grace, He chooses to bless. So, that was a little cycle. So pride tells us, the manna falling from the sky, and we get up every morning and there's food on the ground, and God says, don't take too much because, you know, it'll spoil, and then I'm only going to give you enough for today. And we go out there, and sure enough, like he says, the food is there. And, and well, what about tomorrow, though? I'm not sure. One day is pretty miraculous, but two days is out of control. So, so we get up, and, and there it is. But Lord... I just kind of wish I could have more. That's pride. It's telling God that you deserve much more than what you've received. He knows your need. He knows who you are. He knows how you think. He knows what to do. And His timing is perfect. That's the pride. So the third part of this is actually... This word that I'm about to tell you was actually first used in the book of Job. Have you ever looked at that awesome, awesome book? Uh, one of these days I'm going to preach on Job and I'm going to tell you what it's really about and it's going to blow your mind, so just act like your mind's blown right now. Okay. <laughs> because I'm still not done studying it yet, so let's act like I'm really knowledgeable on it at this moment. So. Verse 3, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. Duplicity, we know, is a word that, that means that you are one way in one group of people, this is just one of the examples, but then in another group of people, you're another way. Let's say you're ta talking a big game over here, but you don't deliver over here. Um, in this particular case, what I talked about earlier in this, in this scripture or in my message was that, you know, it, it's great to follow God, but there's still a part of us that kind of still wants to have a foot in paganism or in the world. Just to kind of see what it's all about. I'm building a testimony, as we say, you know. You ever heard that phrase? <laughs> guilty, guilty, guilty. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You still want to follow God and call yourself a Christian. You want to do all those kind of things. Maybe you still can. But, but at the same time, you kind of still want to do the dance. Okay, I'm going to get the blank stairs here. Okay, good. All right, so got uh, some shifting and some seats. Oh, wait. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so this idea of duplicity means that you can't be trusted. If you really look at it from the very source, sometimes it's not just because you're, you're some evil, sinister villain or something like that. It's because you're still trying to figure out your faith and what that looks like. Maybe you have a misunderstanding of something in Scripture or something like that. But here's an interesting word that comes up when we, when we back up to the beginning of that verse 3. And it's the word that's first used in Job. If you remember the story of Job, it was a situation where the devil tempted him and tested him and, and it essentially took away everything from him. And there was this progression of things that Job was losing. So it was, you know, farm animals, it was crops, it was... It was home, it was eventually uh, children, eventually wife. But there was this period of time in which his wife, seeing the destruction, and knowing that all he had to do, according to what he had heard, was curse God, just renounce your faith, and everything will be restored. <coughs> The wife looks around and says, well, what is going on here? Like, why are you allowing this to happen? And there's this interesting phrase, and I, I want to say it's like in verse 20, I mean in chapter 23 maybe, that the wife looks at Job and she says, how long 
Are you going to sit there and maintain your integrity? That's the word. Same word, integrity, here in verse 3. What she was really asking is, why is your allegiance continuing to be with God? Why are you being faithful to Him? If God, and by the way, I'll say this, that predominantly pagan culture back then, and really even today, pagan culture says that if bad things are happening to you, that means the gods are not pleased. It, I mean, so, if she had one foot in other gods, and you know, I'll, I'll humor you while you worship the one true God, then it would be completely understandable that obviously you're doing something wrong, right? How long, Job, are you going to be, are you going to maintain your integrity? How long are you going to be faithful to this God? Yeah, He says He loves you, and then He'll, he'll, he'll restore everything. But how long are you going to do that? Two chapters later, we see the resolve in Job, where he's, he makes a declaration that is counterintuitive to his circumstance. And he says this outrageous claim, I know my Redeemer lives, and in the end He will stand upon the earth. That didn't make any sense. Because he had lost everything. Fast forward, spoiler alert, he continues to be faithful to God and everything is restored. Yes. So this idea of integrity is not just hey, I'm walking in and I have influence and I... I shake hands, hug, and kiss babies, and things like that. And people overall trust me. This word integrity goes deeper than that, saying that this means faithfulness in God Himself and what He is doing. I think that and is very important. Because a lot of us will raise our hand and say, Yeah, I believe in God. I believe what Scripture says. I believe that. God created everything, and I believe that He can bless and He does miracles and all that kind of thing. But that's one thing to be, believe in God, but it's another thing to believe in what He says. It's that difference of what we've talked about in the past, and maybe you've read the book or seen the videos, but it's the difference between being a fan of God, or Jesus in, this, in our context, or just being a or, or, or being a follower or being a fan. I love applauding when he does stuff, but am I, am I maintaining my integrity? I follow him, and, and integrity would say, would say that I follow him no matter what. I'm just not a fair weather fan. Am I maintaining my integrity through all circumstances? So when we look at Proverbs, the, this, this book is much more than just a uh, some really nice little sayings that maybe we can stitch on a pillow from time to time and frame on our wall and do all those kind of things that help us to remember just some good advice. Maybe if I do more Proverbs stuff, my business will grow. Maybe my marriage will do better. Maybe that maybe my relationships will increase. Maybe people will start coming to me for advice. It is not that. It is much, much more. So I guess I could say it's that, but not only that. What God is telling us is if we live as separate from the world, as separate folks with a different citizenship, we are not going around with our chest, the chest puffed down like, I'm, I'm better than everyone else. We are, we are humbly walking in with our heads down, with, with, with our eyes covered, because we are not worthy, but at the same time knowing that we're children of the King. Right. Amen. That we're here to serve. We're here to love. Right. So,
So whatever circumstance you're going through, I'm going to go backwards. Whatever circumstance you're going through, how long are you going to maintain your integrity? This is also the part, by the way, if you look in the book of Job, well, then she then says, well, will you just curse God and die? Let's get this over with. And some of us, a little side note, we know that God's timing is perfect, but we kind of have a threshold when it comes to waiting for Him, right? We, don't, we can't really define it. We can't say an exact day, but when it gets past that day, we go, well, God, you know, God closes doors. It must not be His, His will. What if God's answer for you, whatever you're praying for, is going to take much, much longer? Is He still good? I mean, we can say yes as Christians because, yes, oh, that sounds great. But when we're in the midst of it, it's not true. We you know I'm being facetious. How long are you going to maintain your integrity? How long are you going to be faithful to God? How long are you going to let this happen? Oh, obviously God has closed the door here. Obviously He is not happy with you. Obviously there is something that's going on behind the scenes that we don't quite see. But I can tell you, if you are leaning on the promises of God, you're in the right place. You're on the right path. You don't have to worry about it. At the same time, you don't have to worry about whether you're kind of frustrated with God. You don't have to hide that because, like I always said, he's a big boy. He can handle it. That's my catchphrase. So I've had to lean on that a lot. God is not going to be angry with you because you're tired of waiting. He gets it. He created you in your mother's womb. He understands you, the way you think, the way you're created, the way that you process things. He understands that. So backwards. How long will you maintain your integrity? Do you have a, a source or a, a heart of pride when it comes to those things that you prayed about? Lord, I have asked you for this for so long, I'm expecting you by midnight on Friday to, to make it happen. <laughs> Some of us want to do that just to see what happens. And I will never badmouth a brother or sister in the Lord, a preacher. But I will say this. There are a lot of false teachings out there that lead us to believe that we can, that we can tell God what to do. I'm not going to go any further than that. You don't know what I'm talking about. Do we have a source of pride? Do I think that our prayers do something and God responds to that? Absolutely. I've seen it physically. But He's never going to do something that is. And this, I have a lot of side notes in my messages in case you didn't notice that. <laughs> This is just kind of a humorous thing for me. And I'm trying to figure out how to say it that's very direct. God will never, ever, ever, ever put a million more evers on that and then times that by two. God will never, ever ask you to do something that is contrary to His Word. Do we, do we get that? Yes. Never. Because if he does, he's not God. And he'll never go contrary to his will, blah, 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 so on and so forth. So, those things that we are praying for, do we have a prideful or haughty attitude like, Lord, you need to get this taken care of because I'm your child. Don't ever forget that he had his children wander the desert 
And as we know, Andy Griffin is all. <laughs> No, it's good. And Amy Griffith wandered the desert for it. No. So, do we, do we understand? It's okay. I love that show, by the way. Anyone else love that show? Those are the good old days. So, could you repeat what you said about the word? Yes. <laughs> don't ever forget, and I was going to, yeah, thank you. I, don't ever forget that he had his children wander the desert for 40 years. You might raise your hand today and say, well, I can't wait that long. Mm. My parents used to have a word they would say, and you think if I can recall it, tough. <laughs> <laughs> Parenting 101, if you have a child, that's a good word to use. <laughs> so, notice it's on the forefront of my mind, easily recall. Um, don't ever forget that. Because as much as we are children of God, He also wants to grow us in the journey. And He wants us, and I've talked about this many times, He wants us to be different people that show up at our destination than when we were only started. So prideful. Are we prideful? Are we shaking our fist at God? You owe me this. Because He owes us nothing. And the things that we do, going back, if we're going backwards to this passage, the things that we do, the things that we partake in, the regular business of our everyday business, are we doing so in whatever we do in a way that honors the Lord, or are we doing the way that is just trying to get by? Because if God wants us to be separate from the world, but still maintaining a presence in the world, that if we are living for God, if we are living for the Lord, if we are doing what He asks us to do, people are going to look at us like, you're, you're kind of different than the rest of us. Can you tell me more? Your citizenship will lead to conversation. So, this is much more than just a book that just giving us great advice. Like, hey, don't, don't cheat people out of money. Don't do those kind of things. It's saying much more than that. It's what I said last week. If you're living for God, quit messing around. Praise team, I'm going to ask you to come forward here. If you... During this time, they're going to be singing, leading us in, in some songs. And if you would like to come, we use this for those of you who don't come very often um, and you're visiting um, or you've never been here before, we use this area as our kind of makeshift altar. And you can come down here and you can do your business with God, but if you stand up and you leave unaffected, then I don't really know the answer to that. I don't know what the rest of that is. But God wants to change you right where you're sitting right now. I invite you to a time of prayer. You can pray in your seat too. But don't miss this opportunity for God to come and invade your life and turn it upside down.